When we eat, our body takes in the food and breaks it down into a sugar called glucose. And glucose is like the fuel for our body's cells. Insulin is an important hormone that signals our cells to take in that glucose. If our diet habits are poor and we have too much glucose in our bloodstream and the cells become resistant to insulin, blood glucose levels will rise and people can develop diabetes. There is a blood test called hemoglobin A1C that doctors can use to see how well someone's blood glucose levels have been maintained over the previous two to three months. Now, hemoglobin is a part of our red blood cells that helps bring oxygen from our lungs to our cells in our body. When sugar levels in our blood are too high, some of that sugar will stick to the hemoglobin. And this blood test, the HbA1c, measures the percentage of hemoglobin that has sugar attached to it. The higher the percentage, the higher the blood glucose level has been in the blood over the previous few months. Typically, a normal level for HbA1c would be below 5.7. Between 5.7 and 6.5 may be determined to be Pre-diabetes and anything above 6.5% is considered diabetes. Now, these are rough estimates. And doctors can use this HbA1c blood test to see how well diabetic patients are controlling their blood glucose levels over the past few months. Now, for a diabetic patient to be able to reduce the HbA1c level by 1%, say going from 8.5 to 7.5, can have significant health benefits. For example, there was a meta-analysis of 10 studies with over 7,000 people with type 2 diabetes, and they found that for each 1% reduction in their HbA1c, that there was an 18% reduced risk of cardiovascular disease, a 13% reduced risk of coronary heart disease, a 17% reduced risk of stroke, and a 28% reduced risk of peripheral arterial disease. In this video, I'll review how exercise can reduce blood glucose levels showing up as a reduced HbA1c for diabetic patients. I'll also review what type of exercises are best, what intensity, and how much we need for the best results. Hi, I'm Dr. Edmund Kleeman. I'm an orthopedic surgeon here in New York. I specialize in sports medicine and arthroscopic surgery. There are many studies that show that exercise can improve glucose metabolism and improve insulin sensitivity. And there are different theories about the mechanism, how this works. One theory is that uh, exercise can increase some of the proteins, one called GLUT4, which is an important protein that helps regulate the transportation of glucose from the bloodstream into, let's say, muscle cells, and so therefore will decrease blood glucose levels in our bloodstream. For example, here's a meta-analysis that demonstrates the benefits of exercise. It was a meta-analysis of 26 randomized controlled trials with over 2,000 participants with type 2 diabetes. The average exercise frequency was three days a week, 45-minute sessions, and about an average of 21 or 22 weeks. And almost all the studies in this meta-analysis reported a significantly decreased level of HbA1c with exercise. Another meta-analysis that supported this, this was a meta-analysis with about 500 participants, found that for those people who had done the exercise program, their HbA1c levels were about 0.66% lower than those groups of people that did not exercise. And so this is a significant amount that we would expect to reduce the risk of diabetic complications. And to put it into context, people who take metformin has been shown to reduce the HbA1c levels by about 1.1%. So you can see that exercise can have a significant benefit on reducing HbA1c levels. Another important aspect that this study shed light on was that for those people who were exercising, they did not need to lose weight to gain this benefit of lowering the HbA1c levels. So what kind of exercise works best to treat diabetes? What's best at reducing those HbA1c levels? Is it aerobic exercise? Is it resistant training or some combination of both? And so multiple studies and multiple meta-analyses have found that both aerobic and resistant exercise seem to similarly do a good job. However, it does appear that doing a combined program with both aerobic and resistant training seems to give even greater benefits to reduce those HbA1c levels. Now, additionally, those people who have worse glucose control, like HbA1c levels are very high, those people who start off in a worse situation, they tend to benefit the most from the exercise routines. 
So here's an example of a meta-analysis that had 12 trials, over 600 uh, patients with diabetes, and on average, people were doing exercise for about four months. So the resistance training, these were typically three sessions a week, each session lasting about 30 to 60 minutes. Uh, it usually involved five to 10 different muscle groups. People were usually doing about two to three sets of each muscle group, and they were doing about eight to 10 repetitions for each of the exercises. Now, for the aerobic exercise, again, people were using mostly a treadmill, they were walking or cycling, again, three sessions per week, usually between 40 to 60 minutes, and an intensity somewhere between 60 and 80% of their heart rate reserve. Okay, so what they found was that HbA1c levels similarly reduced in both. So it reduced by 0.32% for resistant exercises and by 046 for aerobic exercise, so very similar. This suggests that people can choose whichever exercise they like better, aerobic or resistance training, and they will see similar improvement. Now, another meta-analysis with 37 studies and over 2,000 patients with type 2 diabetes. So again, they found very similar improvement with resistant aerobic training, each of them reducing it by about 0.3% the HbA1c. But when they combined aerobic and resistant training, they showed even a greater reduction in the HbA1c and that was reduced by 0.53%. So better benefits when you combine the program. So it appears from what we've been discussing that all different types of exercise will help reduce HbA1c levels, improving diabetes and glucose control. But what intensity? Should it be high intensity, low intensity, moderate intensity? So the theory is, is that the higher the intensity, the faster that uh, people's cells will consume the blood glucose levels and reduce blood glucose. And there have been several studies and meta-analyses that have looked at this. And it appears that high-intensity interval training does a better job than low-intensity training. But choosing between high-intensity interval training and sort of moderate, uh, intermediate, continuous training seems to be similar. For example, this meta-analysis of 13 trials with 345 type 2 diabetic patients found that both High intensity interval training and moderate intensity continuous training improved HbA1c levels. But the high intensity interval training did a better job and reduced the HbA1c level by an additional 0.3%. Now, additionally, the high intensity interval training had the additional benefit of doing a better job at improving cardiorespiratory fitness. And I've discussed cardiorespiratory fitness uh, benefits in other videos. Now let's talk about volume, meaning how long do you need to do a program? Can it just be a few weeks or does it need to be a few months? Additionally, how many times a week do you need to work out? So here are a couple of studies that look at this. So here's a meta-analysis of 27 studies, about 1,000 people with type 2 diabetes, and they found that on average, exercise could reduce the HbA1c level by 0.8%, so that's very good. However, in studies that showed that the exercise routine was less than 12 weeks, then the reduction was halved, only about a 0.4% reduction. So you could see the importance of maintaining exercise for extended durations of time. And here's another meta-analysis that looked at how many sessions should you be doing. And so in this meta-analysis of 26 randomized controlled trials with over 2,000 patients with type 2 diabetes, and they followed these people for about six years, and they found that for each additional aerobic exercise session per week, there was a corresponding decline of HbA1c level by 0.39%. And in those people who are doing the combined program, every additional resistant exercise set per week corresponded to a, a decrease, an additional decrease of HbA1c by 0.02%. This study demonstrates the continued benefit that the more exercise we do, the better we can do on reducing the HbA1c levels. Let's wrap up this video and go over a few key points. Number one, exercise reduces HbA1c levels. Number two, both aerobic exercise and resistant training seems to do a good job at reducing the HbA1c levels. Number three, the combining of aerobic and resistant training programs seems to even do a better job at improving glucose levels with a lower HbA1c level. Number four, both high intensity and moderate intensity continuous training seem to similarly reduce HbA1c levels, but high intensity interval training seems to give a better benefit for improving cardiorespiratory fitness. And number five, 
Increasing the volume, the number of sessions of exercise we do every week will continue to provide more and more benefit of controlling glucose and reducing the HbA1c levels. Thanks for watching this video. I hope you found it helpful. If you did, please click the like button below and subscribe. I look forward to seeing you in my next video or in my office.